Good morning, class. Today, the class covers chapter 11 of the textbook. The topic is trade policy in developing countries. The final two chapters on international trade, chapters 11 and 12, discuss trade policy considerations in the context of specific issues. Chapter 11 focuses on the use of trade policy in developing countries and Chapter 12 focuses on new controversies in trade policy. Although there is great diversity among developing countries, they share some common policy concerns. These include the development of domestic manufacturing industries, the uneven degree of development within the country, and the desire to foster economic growth and improve living standards. This chapter discusses both the successful and unsuccessful trade policy strategies that have been applied by developing countries in attempts to address these concerns. So the question about trade is, you know, what do you do about the negative consequences of trade, if anything? So um, th this is a, a huge argument in, in the economy and one of the, um, well, used to be a, a big point of difference between Democrats and Republicans, and but we've seen free trading Democrats like Bill Clinton and, you know, Republicans that have come in increasing tariffs and other trade protections, George W. Bush, for example, on steel and softwood lumber, et cetera. So it's, it's not always on party lines. Um, nevertheless, it's a, it's a big argument. Uh, what do you do, if anything, about um, people who've lost their jobs due to an increase in, in trade, uh, reduction of, of tariffs? So, so let's, let's think about that. Uh, one knee-jerk reaction is to say, oh, somebody's been hurt by trade, a steel worker lost his job, um, whatever, you, you hear it, you know, outsourcing, people lost their jobs, oh, we should, we should ban trade, um, we, sh we should impose trade barriers. Well, what, one thing is, is I couldn't resist the, this cartoon, with cars especially, it's hard to tell what's American. Uh, BMWs and Mercedes and Hyundais and Hondas and Toyotas are often built in the U.S., whereas the Fords and uh, some of the GM cars and, and um, I suppose the Chryslers too are, are made in Mexico or Canada, so it's hard to tell. But but uh, one reaction is to say, oh, we should put tariffs up. Well, you know, there there's some problems with that, and it was, maybe it's the right thing to do. But um, the gains from trade are lost uh, when you impose tariffs. So so every the size of the economic pie is smaller and. Uh, that's that's a real loss to the economy. Also, you, you know, you try to help one group of people in the eco economy by uh, imposing trade barriers. Well, you hurt another part of the economy. Uh, we're going to do a case on um, solar panels, and you know, it happens that Solar World, uh, uh, solar panel maker, is right here in in Hillsboro, um, so it hits close to home. But you know, there's if we protect solar world, it means solar panels are going to be more expensive. And then there's a lot of solar panel installers, companies that are hurt because now their, their inputs are more expensive. And a lot of homeowners that might, you know, convert to solar if it's inexpensive, now it's expensive. And uh, it's either going to cost them more or they're not, they're going to stick with what they've got. And so, you know, there's a, there's an environmental issue there too. So it's, it's not always uh, so simple and, and very often imposing trade barriers is not a very good option. So, so what do you do um, else? Uh, one, one camp would have you uh, redistribute. Okay, we, we know that through trade, the winners win more than the losers lose. At present, we really don't have any mechanism to transfer those, those uh, 
gains from the winners to the losers. They're, they're, um, so we could do that. We could tax the rich and, and um, pay money to the poor, especially the, the poor that are shown to have lost their jobs to become poor due to trade agreements. And, and that's, that's been tried. And, and that, that idea certainly might have some merit as well. However, there, there are some problems there. One is uh, redistributing, taxing some people and, and supporting others. It, it, it um, can, can really have negative consequences for, for people's incentive to work and, and the size of the pie. Um, on the side of the rich, you, you know, some argue that, oh, the rich aren't going to work as hard. Um, their, their incentive to work is, is reduced if, if taxes are high. And, and that's certainly true at some level. Um, if if you, you've got a marginal tax rate of 40%, well, that means if I earn an extra dollar, I only get to keep 60 cents of it. But you know, I'm not sure that's where the problem, the biggest part of the problem is, is, is you know, the, we see all over the economy, Bill Gates is still working. Um, well, I guess he, he's stepped back a little bit and doing charity work. But, but we see people that are making billions of dollars, millions, millions and millions of dollars a year, and they're still working. So, you know, there's something else driving that. Not to say that's not an important effect, but it's, it's probably on the other end. What if you lost your job due to a trade agreement? And now you've got a check coming in the mail. This is the way they did it with NAFTA. All you had to do was uh, show you had lost your job due to um, your your uh, companies moving jobs to Mexico, and you were entitled for a, quite a quite a payout. Well, well, that payout is coming in. You're, you know, you're not your incentive to go find a new job is pretty small, and that's a lot of idle resources, and and that's waste. So, so um, that direct payments to poor, it, it it's not a great way to encourage the poor poor people to work, and um, th this is you know pretty pretty big problem with that approach. Another approach that has been, it, it, it has been argued that the United States has succeeded in this approach, and, and certainly in some eras that's, I, I think, quite true. But um, one, one argument is, look, you know, don't try to intervene. Don't try to go help the people that lost their jobs and you know, pass legislation to protect them. Create a, a labor market and an economy where if people lose their jobs, it's really easy to find other jobs. And, and um, you know, that used to work almost economy-wide in the United States. But um, in, in our current economy, and this predates the Great Recession, if you had high skills, you, you, you're pretty easy to land on your feet. Uh, my brother's a software programmer, and people are constantly moving. You know, one startup goes bust, they find 10 offers, you know, the next week. But, you know, for, for the common man, the, it, it, it is very difficult if you're a relatively low-skilled worker to lose the job in one sector and, and find, find employment in another sector. And, this is especially true once you're my age, mid fifties. You know, you're you're just old enough where it probably isn't going to make sense for a company to put a lot of resources into retraining you. Um, so, so uh, you know, the the U.S. though has historically had a much um, smaller intervention into labor markets in Europe and Latin America. You see laws that you know, protect workers from being laid off. You lay off a worker. If a company lays off a worker, you have to pay them for a whole year. You know, they, these extreme policies. Uh, the problem with that is that if, if that's what you have to do when, when you've hired a worker, well, well you, you, you know, companies are going to be real careful about hiring workers and they're not going to hire workers as much under that kind of a, a legal system. So the U.S. has had a much more open... Uh, labor market, and there has been a lot more success in past decades, uh, especially in in placing people that have lost their jobs. And I, you know, we we may yet return to that, but um, it, that, that's you know, it, there's a good argument to be made that 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 isn't working as well as it used to. Uh, but anyway, that's that's one position in this argument. Another uh, argument about trade, and Paul Krugman, who's an international economist and, and a fairly liberal um, 
uh, political and economic commentator writes for the New York Times. He's argued, and he's free, he's a pro-trade guy, by the way. Um, but but he's argued that hey, look, you know, we we can't have people that lose their jobs because of trade agreements. We can't have them immiserated to the extent that they are now. This system is not that we have today is not working for poor people. Uh, and he's argued that what the country should do is to have um, public amenities that are that are granted to all citizens, uh, whether they're rich or poor, and uh, those those public amenities are are not lost when you lose your job. So so he, you know, certainly he would point to the uh, European systems where um, high quality education is free, not just at the uh, grammar school level, but at high school and college level too. That's a public amenity. So if you lose your job, you don't lose your ability to send your kids uh, to a good school and, and give them a, a future hope. Um, also healthcare. Uh, it, the U.S. is just about alone and now with, with some changes, some reforms, um, there's a lot more um, help for people that can't afford healthcare. But, but the U.S. is almost alone in, maybe alone, in having a privatized healthcare system. And Obamacare didn't, didn't much change that, um, un unless you were, um, you're, you're very poor. For most of us though, that didn't affect us. Um, the fact, and then I, I guess Obamacare did reduce the pain of losing the healthcare provided through work. But, but historically in the US, if you lost your job because of um, it, well, for, for whatever reason, you often lost health care and and then got ill and and you know the the number one cause of personal bankruptcy has been health care for some time for has been health has been illness and if if you had a public socialized uh, health care system um, you lose your job well okay you, you don't lose health care that's a, a amenity that it is independent having that is independent of your wealth or income status and that, that's been argued that if we had such such policies in place the the pain of losing a job the um, the ability to keep your health and other aspects of your well-being until you found your next job would be um, preserved and indeed these public amenities offering these public amenities wouldn't have the same problem as other uh, redistributive policies because th they aren't they're available to everybody they're not um, you know, you're not getting a paycheck in the mail. You're not getting, um, I, well, I guess I'll leave it at that. The, you, you don't sit at home getting paid. You, you just have some public amenities that, um, you have access to and you can send your kids to school, not get sick, etc., or not get treatment when you're sick, even if, if you're out of work. Made with DoodleCast Pro. The trade war between the world's two largest economies reaches far beyond their borders. We'll discuss how the U.S.-China trade dispute is impacting developing countries from Africa to Latin America. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. There appears to be no end in sight to the U.S.-China trade war. Since July, Washington and Beijing have levied 25% tariffs on each other's goods, worth $34 billion, and in two weeks, each country will target another $16 billion in goods. U.S. President Donald Trump is readying 25% tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese goods, and China says it will respond with additional tariffs on $60 billion in U.S. goods. The U.S. tariffs on steel and aluminium imports from Canada, Mexico and the European Union are also causing ripple effects around the world. South Africa says nearly 8,000 jobs in the steel and aluminium industry are now at risk and its currency, the RAND, continues to lose value. For more on the global implications of the U.S.-China trade war, let's bring in our panel. Here in the studio is Arthur Dong. He's a professor at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. Also with us, Robert Moran. He's a partner with Brunswick Insight, a consulting firm on global opinions and market research. From Johannesburg, we're joined by Sia Beniza. He's a political economist and the finance and operations director 
at Political Economy Southern Africa. And Manuel Suarez Maya is a Latin America economic consultant and former chief Latin American economist for Bank of America. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Arthur, let's start right here in the studio with you. So this tariff dispute between the United States and China is escalating. The latest we hear is that the U.S. has announced more tariffs, $16 billion worth of Chinese goods. China, for its part, says it will impose counter tariffs. Now, we've heard about the effect that these tariffs are having on these two countries, the United States and China. Uh, but what about the rest of the world? Will there be collateral damage here? Oh, without a doubt. Uh, as we see these tariffs start to take, uh, take effect, there will be secondary and tertiary impacts around the world. As we all know, China is a, a, a nation that uh, not only does a lot of manufacturing, but many of the inputs that go into the China manufacturing base are sourced from other countries all over the world. So therefore, uh, a slowdown in, in the manufacturing uh, uh, possibilities for China will also mean that other nations will, in a sense, uh, also feel the impact and catch a cold as a result. Let's go to Johannesburg. Sia, as we just heard from Arthur, uh, manufacturing is now a very complex process. We have complex supply chains all over. If we look at a country like South Africa and look at its automobile industry, for instance, uh, South Africa exports key auto components to the United States. What will tariffs do to South Africa's competitiveness? All right, so they've already estimated that at least 7,000 jobs will be affected by the tariff increase. Um, mainly our automotive exports, as you mentioned, uh, catalytic converters being the most affected. Uh, but also our other manufacturing exports, such as household goods manufact uh, manufactured, such as microwaves, uh, washing machines, etc., are also going to be affected by this, uh, the tariff increase. And um, the worst is that we made a lot of compromises to secure our position in AGOA, uh, which was supposed to give us special access to the U.S. market. But obviously with these tariffs, this undermines this. And at the same time, it undermines some of the bargains and the, the trade-offs uh, that we have had to make as a country in order to secure access to the U.S. market. So how does a country like South Africa safeguard its interests? Do you now start looking at other markets? Definitely. I think this will definitely push the South African manufacturers or exporters at least to look at least uh, towards eastern markets. Obviously, the traditional markets in terms of the EU still remain open. Uh, but more increasingly, especially with the signing of the Africa Free Trade Area Agreement, the African market seems to be a viable option particularly for South African exporters. Uh, but it's a very difficult road to walk, uh, def definitely because it's very difficult to integrate some of the local suppliers when expanding the value chain into the rest of the continent, which is critical to ensure that uh, the process of, of intra-Africa trade is mutually beneficial. So yes, uh, with the tariffs in the US, the South African exporters will be looking towards Eastern markets, the traditional EU markets, as well as the African markets. Manuel, we hear about the, how these tariffs could hurt developing countries, the negative impact of these tariffs. But I'm wondering, could some countries actually emerge as winners? Let's take Brazil as an example in Latin America. Uh, Brazil is a supplier, is a producer of soybeans, for instance. Um, could it take the place of those exports from the United States to, say, China? Sure. Uh, to, to the extent that you have trade diversion, as it's called technically, uh, trade that is being diverted from the U.S. Uh, to Brazil or Argentina, which are prime producers of raw materials and uh, uh, particularly grains and that sort of thing, uh, you can expect that those countries will benefit to the detriment of the U.S. Uh, but the losses are much greater than the wins. The overall uh, balance of cost-benefit analysis of trade wars is negative in, in the general spectrum. Now, there is a major difference between particularly Mexico and the rest of Latin America. Mexico is competing uh, with China in the U.S. market. So we are more competitive rather than complementary, which is the case of Brazil and Argentina. Uh, in our case, in the case of Mexico, it's going to be far more difficult to diversify and to increase our exports to China to compensate for the exports that will no longer be going to the U.S. You talk about the losses for Brazil. What are the broad losses for Brazil in uh, a dispute of this kind? Well, 
the broad losses imply that the costs of production, the, the, the breaking of uh, the, the chains of production uh, will affect their costs overall and their efficiency. Now, the case of Brazil is, is particular in the sense that Brazil is a fairly closed economy, uh, much more closed than other economies in, in South America. Um, so in, in a sense, being closed already affects them uh, in a smaller way. Uh, so they have less to lose, which is the opposite of very open countries like Mexico, which have far more to lose. Robert, the United States has generally supported free trade, uh, especially after the Second World War. In fact, this country played a key role in writing the rules of free trade around the world. Uh, but when we look at these protectionist measures, um, how will it affect the main trading partners of the United States? Because the conventional view has always been that if your trading partners are prospering, then you get rich as well. No, this is, uh, at least in my opinion, the, one of the more frustrating things about this. Um, it appears that America is having a, a short attention span and a short memory. At the end of World War II, both parties supported a globalization, a free trade agenda, um, with the idea that a prosperous trading world would be a less uh, warlike world, and, um, and also with the goal of bringing allies together and integrating with them um, economically. And there was enormous success. People forget that, you know, a little longer than a generation ago, South Korea was an extremely poor country, about uh, around the GDP per capita of Ghana, and it's tr exploded. And it didn't happen by accident, right? It happened because of globalization and free trade. And the whole strategy for America was to build uh, up our allies and friends around the world with trade. We appear to be, or at least part of the American political system, appears to be reverting to what it looked like in America in the 1890s, where you had the Republican Party as the protectionist party. I'm not sure that works as well in a globally integrated worldwide economy today. Um, and I think that's possibly very difficult to, to defend. Um, we have plenty of data around the world, not only f showing that free trade has helped pull uh, people out of poverty and pull countries out of poverty. We also have opinion data showing that globalization, especially in emerging market countries, uh, is actually more popular than it is in um, more uh, advanced economies around the world. So uh, emerging markets do understand that this actually is a net net benefit to them. So this is a very complicated situation right now. Um, my concern is that the political feedback loop, um, we might learn, take the wrong lessons from this. Um, and sort of mislearn some of the things that talking we should about, be learning in the U.S. Right, talking about politics, uh, Robert, uh, what is the impact inside the United States? I mean, politicians like Donald Trump, they always have an eye to elections and right. politics in the country. Right, uh, yeah, and my background is in, is in political polling. So the challenge here, I think, is, is, is that net-net, um, these trade actions are marginally unpopular right now. They may grow to be even more unpopular as some of the costs bite, and I'm not sure they exactly are. We see some data that just came out from the Atlanta Fed that suggests that businesses are, U.S. businesses, at least in the Atlanta Fed region, are reconsidering some of their investment because of this. That, that's interesting. Um, but right now, U.S. public opinion is split, but just marginally negative towards it. So 41% think that Trump's trade policies are a change for the better. 42% say they're a change for the worse. 49% um, say that increasing tariffs is bad for the country. 40% think it's good for the country. This is the problem of hyper-partisanship with, with almost anything um, at this point in time. With all that said, the support for U.S. farmers is actually, there's a majority support for U.S. farmers in existing polling. The challenge for the Trump coalition or the, the, the Trump folks is that on one hand, it's net-net unpopular for them in the United States. On the other hand, in some of the, in some of the states they need to win to win re-election in the right. Electoral College, it could be popular. We don't mm -hmm. know. Some of the agricultural red states, this could end up being unpopular and then right. hurting them. But this could be popular in Pennsylvania and Illinois and Wisconsin, et cetera. So the political calculus of this gets very complex very quickly. Arthur, uh, the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, he addressed the trade war uh, at the recent BRICS summit in Johannesburg. This is what he had to say. Let's watch this. A trade war should be rejected because there will be no winner. 
economic hegemony is even more objectionable because it will undermine the collective interest of the international community. Those who pursue this cause will only hurt themselves. So here we hear that statement there. Of course, he's targeting. It's directed at the United States, but China has pretty well established trade relations with countries of Africa, with the countries of Latin America. Um, how is that relationship going to be affected? Well, certainly uh, with Latin America, with Africa, uh, China has become the number one trade partner in uh, these very, very large economies. And so what we will see, for, particularly with these resource-based economies, uh, Brazil, uh, Africa, Chile, uh, they've been highly reliant and dependent on uh, Chinese imports. In other words, China importing those mineral and raw materials uh, for the conversion into building materials and et cetera. And so if China slows down with regard to its you know, economic, uh, economic uh, path of economic advancement, Africa and, and many countries, uh, the large countries in Latin America, will most certainly feel the impact as well. Okay, we need to take a break right now. More of our conversation about the U.S.-China trade conflict and its impact on developing economies. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat.